Okay, welcome everyone. We are uh, excited to welcome our first uh, keynote speaker of Generation Analog, a collaboration between uh, Asmodee Game and Lab Analog Game Studies and Gen Con. Uh, and the, the, our first keynote speaker is Dr. Scott Nicholson, whom I will briefly introduce with a bio and then run out of the way um, so that he can tell us about things. So uh, Dr. Scott Nicholson is a professor and director of the Game Design and Development Program at Wilfrid Laurier University in Brantford, Ontario in Canada. He was the host of the very first YouTube series about board games called Board Games with Scott and was the designer of Tulip Mania 1637 and Going Going Gone. His current focus is on escape rooms and other live action games designed around real world learning outcomes and recently, recently was the lead author of the book, Unlocking the Potential of Puzzle-Based Learning, Designing Escape Rooms, and Games for the Classroom. Uh, without further ado, welcome, Scott. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and putting this activity together and keeping it going. Uh, we, as we've been talking about in the chat, we were supposed to be in person a few years ago. We've continued to keep that thread going. And so it's exciting to be able to talk with folks. So we're gonna start with a little bit of an activity. So let me share this for now, share that. And uh, what we're gonna do is I would like you to think for a minute about your most immersive board game experience. So think to your, think to your board game past, think about games that you've played and think about the single board game experience you had that you would describe as immersive. Now, what I want you to do is jot down a few of the descriptive words about why that was immersive. I don't want you to put, tell, tell it's a name of the game, but instead what I want you to do is to think more about why that was immersive, um, some nouns or verbs that made that immersive. And I want you to now go to www.menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and use the code you see here on the screen, 8235-8751. And I want you to enter the words that describe your most immersive board game experience. So I'll give you two minutes from now to do that. I see words are coming in. In fact, what I'm gonna do now is just because it's interesting to watch this develop. We're gonna share that screen there. Actually, I'll keep it a surprise. I should do some real music here. Do I have any music? I do, I have a train whistle. Because I play 18xx games. And therefore, you know, what really annoys people when you play 18xx games, which are these sort of hardcore activities where you're you're, it's like a war game with trains where you're thinking and staring at each other and it's like, uh, if you watch people play 18xx, they all look like they're constipated because they're thinking so much. But if after each round you do, <laughs> it really annoys people. And if you're doing it at a convention and you do that, <laughs> then it annoys all the people around you. So it's really great fun to uh, have your train whistle noises. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pop up our mentee. Uh, I'm going to share a screen here and pop that up and we'll see what we've come up with. So here is what we have said about what made our board game immersive. So we've got, whoop, whoop, oh, the font's getting smaller and smaller. Let's go in here. <laughs> there, now we're getting a little bigger. As you continue to add things, by the way, as you can see, we've got story as a popular thing, role-playing, narrative agency, surprise, uh, thrilling, We've got art and friends and cooperative and focused, deception, a ticking clock, asymmetry. We've got all sorts of good stuff going on here. Look at all this. It's absolutely crazy. So I'm going to copy this and paste it into our chat, if that'll work. I don't know if that's going to work. We'll find out, won't we? Uh, no, it won't work. So we'll just continue that. So we'll let that develop. I will actually paste that into the Discord after this is all over so you can take a look at what we came up with there. But what I want you to notice is that we have a lot of disagreement about what 
narrative and what, what immersive means. And that's going to be pretty important as we go through this presentation today. So let me get the presentation back running. And we will talk about everything we just explored. So do that. And then we're going to do that. And then we're going to do that. And then we're going to go to there. And we're going to share it. There we go. All right. Now we're off and running. OK. So I'm opening up the chat. Oh, we're, oh, the reason I keep looking over here is this is because this is the window where I have my Zoom stuff. So this is where I can kind of see what's going on over there. OK. So we've now made our mentee. We'll get to see that later. But what's important is to understand that we see things as immersive is very, very different. Um, when we talk about immersive, uh, I like this description from Hamlet and on the holodeck, as far as immersive, that immersion is a, is a term described from the physical experience of being submerged in water. That when you go get into a swimming pool or you plunge in the ocean, the idea of being completely surrounded by water, surrounded by things, is the idea of being immersive, that you have this concept that's completely taking over your attention, taking over your perceptions. Now that's one description of what immersive is. And when I started exploring immersion and I wanted to talk about it, I did some literature reviews of other people that have talked about immersion. So uh, there was a Gama Sutra article that a lot of the video, a lot of the discussion about immersion uh, is around video game immersion, which is a little different than board game immersion, but we'll get into that. Uh, so this Gama Sutra article, it explored three things, a tactical immersion. So immersion because of the physical choices. Now this is for video games. So the physical choices in the game, you're tactically moving, uh, moving your character, your avatar around the screen, that's got you immersed. Or strategic immersion, where your mental, your mindset, you're d deciding what to do, that's one category. Or the narrative immersion, you're interested in the characters, the story. So they explored these types of immersion. And some of that we'll come back to. So this is whenever you start research, you always do a literature review to see what else is out there so that you can combine that as you move forward. There was a, a book, Patterns in Game Design, and it had a focus more on virtual reality. Um, there was a podcast called The Secret Cabal Gaming Podcast where they explored this, have four types of immersion during one of their episodes. This one's more focused on virtual reality as a, and, and, the, and how do you immerse people in VR games. And this broke it down into the physical actions in the game. Are you cognitively immersed in the experience? Do you feel like you're in a physical space or are you emotionally involved in that space? So those are some more things, tools to build from. What I'm doing right now at this stage in my exploration is building the toolbox so that then we can build our tools for making board game immersion, talking about that. Uh, there was in 2016 a literature review where they explored immersion and they looked at all these different immersion models and they put this together and they had two big categories. They looked at the system. So this is again looking more at video games, the property of the system being immersive, the video game system being immersive, and then looking at the player's cognitive response to the game, looking at a perceptual response, a response to narratives, a response to challenges, where you're getting again into flow and strategic and tactical concepts. So again, these are more tools I'm going to grab from as I build up this, uh, this structure for immersion. Now, one thing though I should talk about is I, I wrote a book, my first book was called Everyone Plays at the Library. I used to be a librarian. I've seen a lot of shout outs to libraries here. Yay, libraries and games and libraries. A lot of libraries have games. If you didn't know that, go to your local library and ask them about setting up a game program and you'll find there's a lot of interest there. But what I understood and what I realized as I was thinking about games and libraries is it's not just about the box. These, these are games here, these are games. By the way, this particular game that I randomly grabbed, this is a good roll and move game. I'll throw that out there. Anyway, um, this is a piece of cardboard and bits and pieces, but this is not a game experience. It takes a group of people sitting at a table in an environment to create a game experience. And that's why when I asked you at the beginning to think about your most immersive game, I didn't say, what's your most immersive game? In fact, I didn't even ask you to tell me what that game is because it's about the experience the game is creating. And that was this, this model you see here is was, was the centerpiece of my book where I talked about the fact that a game is creates this game world, but the players interact with each other in three different ways. They interact with each other by pushing pieces at each other. They interact with each other by engaging with each other in the game world and they interact with each other by engaging with each other outside of the game world. So they can have social engagements. But that game world takes place in an environment. So in a library space, there may be spectators or people on the outside that engage with the game. And all of this can change what's going on with immersion. So if you were to play a game in this setting, 
This is your typical uh, game game geeks game room. Uh, you would have you could have a certain kind of immersion engage in this space. But if you took those same people and that same game and you played here, well, this would be a very different kind of game space. This would be a this would feel differently from an immersive experience if you played in a room that looked like this. Even if you have the same people, the same game, the environment changes it. And this would be a very different experience than this, which is where if we were in person, we would be here at Gen Con. You trying to play a game while you're yelling at everyone else across the table because the people right next to you are demoing a game and everyone's screaming and you've been talking for four days and you're exhausted. That's gonna create a very different type of immersion than if you play here, which is where many of us have been staring at over the last year and a half, where this is Board Game Arena, when you are pushing pieces at each other. It's helped a little bit if you can get video chat going, but still the same game, the same people in different environments make a different immersive experience. And this is all stuff we have to think about. When we see the video game immersion and they talk about systems, we have to take into account that the environment that you're playing the game is has a big impact on the immersion that you feel. Now, there was a study I did find from 2020 on board game immersion. And what these folks did is they started with a Reddit forum where people asked, what's the most of immersive game you've ever played? And then they analyzed the forum and then they did a follow-up interview with five people. So it's a very small sample, a biased sample around Reddit, um, but they found a few big problems that got, that got me started as I was thinking about this. And that was what we found at the beginning. There's no, there was no definition they gave us to what they meant by immersive and they found that different people had different concepts of what was immersive. Um, they also identified the same thing we've been talking about, that there's very different in-game conditions and out-of-game conditions that change your perception of immersion. And these in-game conditions can be positive or negative to make you feel more immersed or more or less immersed. And the out-of-game conditions can make you feel more immersed or less immersed. So for example, if someone's sitting there on their phone the whole time when it's not their turn, you're gonna feel a lot less immersed in what's going on. If there's pirate music playing and you're playing a pirate game, then you're gonna feel more immersed in what's going on. If the pirate music is a loop with the same three pirate songs that's been playing for an hour and a half, you're gonna feel annoyed and less immersed in the game. And if the same three songs are being sung along by other people at the table, you may be pulling your hair out by the end of it, which is what happened to me. Anyway, um, so the challenge with designing immersive games and talking about immersive games is that in our world, in a board game world where the players and the table and the environment are all part of that game experience, there are a lot of things we can't control, but we need to recognize that in any model that we talk about. Now they also did, as they explored their grounded theory, they found this balance between challenge and game world. And they found that some people got immersed completely if the game was hard. If that, like those 18xx games, games where you're really focused on it, they got engrossed in the game. But they found also some people got engaged a lot if the game had an interesting story, if that was an engaging story that they could get involved with. So what they did is they created this framework that showed some people looked for that challenge engrossment, some people looked for a split between the, both the challenge and the narrative, and some people really just focus on the narrative. But the most important finding, which is one we're gonna come back to quite a bit, is that we don't know if a game is gonna be immersive because it depends upon the player different players find different things immersive. So if you make a game that's immersive for one person, there'll be someone else that doesn't find that kind of thing immersive, they're not gonna find your game immersive. And it even comes into play with the specific physical game. So if you had chess on a standard chess board as compared to Star Trek chess, some people will get engaged with Star Trek chess much more than with standard chess, even though the game is the same, the components are different. So this is hard. This is hard in the board game world. Now, something else I'm gonna show here is a way that they chose to illustrate their immersion because we're gonna come back to this. What they did is they made this cube. So they have system immersion, narrative immersion and challenge-based immersion. And the idea is that you can put a dot on this cube for your game to show where it is in the video game world. So you can see how immersive it is. We'll come back to that. I also saw one of the previous speakers referred to the mixing decks, the, desk, the mixing deck of LARP. Um, so what this is, is so I've been involved in live action role playing now for some time, uh, for 34, don't do the math, oh my gosh, anyway, uh, for a very long time, and LARP folks think a lot about the in, what's going on in their game, because live action role playing, it, 
immersion is a big part of what we talk about, what we're engaged with, but there's, there's so many fine sliders on what is the game is about. So the idea is that when you're designing a game, you can make move each slider up and down to say, uh, is there a lot of transparency or is there a lot of secrecy? Um, is it a 360 degree world or is there more symbolism in it? So we're gonna talk more about the mixing deck. So we're gonna come back to all these models because when I started this, by the way, the way these talks work is they contact you in this case, like in 1999, uh, no, wait, yeah, a long tw night, tw years, oh, I'm so old, 2019, where they said, hey, Scott, do you want to give a talk? And I'm like, sure, I'll give a talk. And so you think about what you want to talk about. And I was thinking about what I've been doing with escape games for the last few years. And I said, well, why don't I look at how I could combine all this? But then you've got to actually make that content. And as I'm making the content, I'm finding out, oh, there's all this stuff I didn't think about. So I'm showing you that journey I have taken to now move forward with talking about board game immersion. So here we go. So I've come up with a few main things we're going to focus on for our mixing desk when we're talking about board game immersion. And the first is around the concept of challenge. So challenge is getting at that key mental challenge. These are the people who like the, the, the puzzle, who like to get lost in the game. Now that challenge can be a complex challenge or a simple challenge. And that challenge can be ongoing or sporadic. So here's what I mean. In games, some games are set up so that you are having challenge all the time. The turn actions are very short. So Settlers of Catan, for example, is a game that has an ongoing challenge, but it's simple. You're always involved with people wanting to trade stuff with you. So it's ongoing. You're always having to pay attention, but it's not overly taxing. And especially when someone's winning and they get the trade embargo, and you're like, oh, not trading with you. Uh, so that's an ongoing simple challenge. Uh, something like Ticket to Ride um, has a, a, a sporadic, because there's not a lot you're doing in Ticket to Ride when it's not your turn. You're kind of just waiting around for your turn to come around. So it's more sporadic. 18xx, which I've mentioned earlier, is this heavy-duty economic train game, but one of the big problems with it is on your turn, you do a lot of stuff, and then you wait around. There's really very little to nothing for you to do when it's not your turn, and in fact, a horrible 18xx game is when everyone gets on their phones and doesn't. It's, it's so bad that in the rules, it says you should plan out your turn when it's not your turn, <laughs> and then something like Russian Railroads is where you're having ongoing challenges, a little bit to do often, and it is complex. So for people who like challenge, heading up towards ongoing and complex is going to make for a more immersive experience. I explored some other variables, and, and when I write this all into a paper, I'll talk a little bit about this. Um, these aren't my main variables, but there's something to think about, and one is predictability. So some games are predictable. So Trajan, for example, has this Moncala type game mechanism where you can plan out, all right, I'm gonna move this yellow and blue thing and I put yellow here and blue there. And then next turn, I can take these three and I'm gonna put them da, 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 and you can plan out all these actions you're gonna take and you can really get lost and immersed in that challenge. But then you've got luck. So something like Talisman, where it is luck driven, where you roll dice to move on the board and based on what you roll, you then draw a card and the card has a random thing that happens to you. It's a, it's a luck fest. Um, but sometimes that's what you want, and you can get immersed in talisman, but for a very different thing. But for people that hate luck, they can't get immersed in talisman. They're like, no, I, I'm not doing anything. I'm just rolling the dice and drawing cards. And then you've got chaos, and chaos is where the other players' actions could change the game so much that it's not luck, but it's like, what is going on? So turn in taxis, for example, drove me nuts. You'd be planning out all these routes, but someone has the ability to throw all the cards out. And then you're stuck trying to replan everything. And so you're like, I'm not immersed in this at all. You can also look at the amount of direct interaction that you have in place to see if people are going to get engaged with that. So some people like zero sum games. And zero sum games is where if you lose something, I take something. So poker is a zero sum game, for example. Um, Twilight Struggle is a zero sum game. So for me to lose stuff, you take stuff. And for some people, that's really immersive. They want that. They want that competition. Um, then you have games that are really all about achievement, that we're all performing in an obstacle course, and at the end, we're going to score. So roll and write games are like this. Karuba is like this, where everyone's making their own decisions, and you're not really having a lot of impacts on each other. For some people, that's immersive, because they're like, this is my world. No one can mess with me. I'm engaged. And other people like, this is boring. I want to do stuff. And then you have like games, a lot of games in the middle, where people use the general term player interaction, which I didn't want to use here, because... Now we're getting into all sorts of blurry terms, but the idea is that there's some plays that you can mess with each other and some ways that you 
can't mess with each other. So Agricola, for example, you have your own little farm and all of that, but then someone takes the space where you needed those sheep and those are my sheep and I was gonna get those and you've ruined my life. So for some people that's immersive. So as you're starting to see, it's really hard to make immersive games for everyone because different people find different things immersive. Now we're gonna move on to another category and that's the category of social interaction. So I've talked about that a little bit, that difference between in-game social interaction and out of game social interaction. And I was first thinking about the sliders and saying, well, you've got high in game social interaction. So the game has you playing roles. And when that is happening, when there's a lot of in game social interaction, it is hard to have out of game social interaction. So it's hard to engage with you about your social life. How's the wife and kids um, when you are engaged in being in game. And so that was a slider I had with reversed polarity here where the two are connected but I didn't really like that as I thought about it because I realized, well, there's actually two very different kinds of interaction that's going on between players and games. And this, this came from the study about board games. And that was this difference between a role-playing game and a narration game. So here's what I mean. Uh, Battlestar Galactica. This is a game where during the game, you are, and a lot of trader games fall in this role. You could be a Cylon, you don't know. And halfway through the game, you could find out you were a bad guy the whole time. So it's a hidden role game. It's a really, it can be a very immersive game. And what I find is it, when people play Battlestar Galactica, they very much get into, you are a Cylon, not your character is a Cylon. I'm not saying Starbuck is a Cylon. I'm saying you are a Cylon. People get engaged with each other. As compared to a game, that's more about narration. And narration is when you're telling the story of what went on. This is where you find you're talking more in the third person. Um, so when I, there's a, there's a role-playing game called Fiasco. And in Fiasco, the way it works is you go around the table telling stories about your character. And when I play Fiasco with board gamers who might not have a lot of comfort at the role-playing world, I tell them, you can play this game in two ways. You can either play it as a role-playing game where you're saying, I do this and I do that, or you can play it as a narrative game where you're saying, my character John does this and John does that. And I find that people who aren't comfortable role-playing can be comfortable telling a story about their characters. That works really well. So there can be role-playing type immersion or narrative type immersion where you're engaged in watching the story play out, but you don't have a personal role. A lot of board games put you in the role of middle manager. If you think about what you're actually doing, you're not actually in the world. You're sort of this middle manager person that's making decisions for the world to play out. And that's where this narrative immersion can come in. Now, on the other side of that is where there's not a lot of player interaction. And so Galaxy Trucker, half of Galaxy Trucker, uh, is this time where you're staring at the board, you're turning over spaceship pieces and you're putting them on the board. So there's not a lot of interaction between players. Although because everyone's putting their hands out there, there's physical interaction between players, but that's a whole different story. Um, the other half of Galaxy Trucker though becomes a very narrative schadenfreude experience where you're telling the tale of watching your spaceship fall apart and you laugh at that. And so people that can get into that, that narrative game experience can be very immersive with what's going on, but people that don't find that game very frustrating because the second half of Galaxy Trucker is really just watching your spaceship get destroyed. But what's interesting and why I've got a square there is that the less immersion there is in the game, the more chances there are for social engagement outside of the game. And this is something I think about when I go to a game night and I don't know anyone, I want to pick games that do not have a lot of social interaction made in the game because I want to have time to talk with the other people at the table without interrupting the gameplay. So I'll pick lighter games that give me that opportunity to have that engagement, but I can still be immersed. I can still be immersed in the game experience. And that's this difference between the game experience and the specific game is do I have that chance to engage and put my head in the water with the people on the table around me and have the rest of the world go away. The final topic we're gonna to talk about with immersion in board games is representation. So this is getting at the physicalness of games. So board games have this physical component. This is replacing in all the video game work, the fancy graphics and all that stuff. With board games, it's that physicalness. So are the components and or the graphics enabling you to get more engaged in the game world? Or are they interfering with your engagement in the game world? 
So an example, Klondike. Klondike is a hobby game. Hobby games are kids' games in yellow boxes. I highly recommend them if you have kids. Um, many of them have a lot of immersion. They have very playful components, toys and games. So Klondike is a gold panning game. And you have this gold pan that's got marbles in it. And you're rolling them around trying to get all the gold out and not get too much bad stuff out. So that's very, it's enabling. And in the board game world, that's very high fidelity because it's got you engaging with something that is in line with what you're supposed to be doing in the game. But then you have like Everdell, for example. Everdell is this card game, and it comes with this spectacular tree that you set up in the table. But the problem with the spectacular tree is that if you're sitting on the other side of the tree, you can't see the game board. And that's a problem I have. Railroad Tycoon did that. It had these giant plastic pieces that you put on the game board, and it blocked what was going on. So I was less immersed in the game because the component got in the way. So you have to look at, is your, are your components, are they enabling gameplay or are they interfering with gameplay? Um, Homesteaders is uh, showing an example of a low fidelity game. So there's not a lot of fanciness there, but what that little board, that little auction board right there gets you immersed in what's going on because you're out trying to outbid each other. What you're doing is you're putting a cube on the track for the thing you wanna buy. And we've seen other games that have this, Vegas Showdown did, a lot of other games have used this mechanism. Um, but this sort of clear, there's not a lot of anything in the way, but it's still very immersive because you're moving your cube up. If someone puts their cube above you on the track, you have to move to a different track to outbid them. And it's very intense as compared to like what Terraforming Mars did. If you've played it in the basic game, you have this board you're trying to track your components on and these cubes and they're slightly too big for the spaces where they go. And if you bump the table, they go flying everywhere. And then you don't remember what you had. And it's so bad that if you search for terraforming Mars, it is difficult to find the base game because so many people have made fixes <laughs> for you to put the cubes in their little spaces. So this is a case where it gets in the way. So it's, it's too low fidelity. It gets in the way. So we have to think about our representation. Now, fidelity and graphics does not have to be fancy to be immersive. Micro Macro, uh, which was uh, the one, one of the Game of the Year awards this year, is a game about looking at mysteries, solving mysteries. And it's got this giant map that you lay out on uh, over a table. And what you're seeing here is just a tiny close-up. It's these tiny, tiny bits. And what you have to do is you have to look for details because you're going to follow scenes from area to area of this city. So if you look closely at this scene, you know you can see a character in the bottom left-hand corner that's lying there. There's glasses and like a balloon or something. So it looks like that character is dead. Then you look at the scene to see, well, where else do I see that character on this map? And can I tell, can I come up with a story that happened between these different vignettes? So fidelity does not necessarily mean fancy graphics, but it means immersive graphics. I'm immersed in this world because of the detail that you've given me. So putting all of this together. So remember we saw that cube earlier. So now we've got these three things we're gonna put together. So we've got our, uh, our ongoing and sporadic and our complex and simple and our high fidelity and interfering. And so we can put that all together into the prism of board game immersion. And since we have a prism, we might as well have a rainbow because that's what prisms make. So that will produce the rainbow of player fulfillment. And you know what's at the end of rainbows, don't you? The pot of Kickstarter gold, of course. Once you have everything and everyone's immersed, they can have Kickstarter gold and Kickstarter gold would not be good without unicorn stretch goals. That's right, that's stop. Oh my God, stop, 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 stop. Okay, all right, hang on, hang on. All right. So let's get back to just the straight up elements of board game immersion. Back to my boring world here. And that is our three things we're going to talk about. Challenge, social interaction, and representation. So the idea here is that these are the three things we're going to look to do when we're making a board game, if we want to make that board game more immersive. Now, I should stop for a minute and let you know that, because I know some people are out there saying, I don't want all this. This is not for everybody. This is not for every game. Every game does not need to be immersive. Every game does can just be, can't my just game just be a puzzle where I get to think a lot? Yes, it can. Yes, it can. Not all games need to try to be immersive to all players. And that was this key finding is that you can't be immersive to everyone. You can't do it. And this is a challenge to bring it around to the point of this conference is making games for classrooms. If you're making a game for classrooms, you have to try to make something that is immersive for a lot of different types of players. 
how can you make one game that immerses everybody when each person sees immersion in a different way? And this is why it's very hard. So if you look at this picture, you can see that each student is immersed in what's going on in very, very different ways. So how do you make games that tie in to tie that in? So how is it when each person has one of these things they like and finds immersion over the other things, can you address it all? And some games do. Some games try to say, all right, well, we're going to have an ongoing complex challenge all the time that we're going to have role playing going on and we're going to make it high fidelity because it's going to be in Kickstarter and we're going to make a whole bunch of really cool bits and it's going to be all exciting. Well, let's, uh, let's step away from that and have a word from our sponsor. And that sponsor is Escape Room. So I got involved in Escape Rooms about seven years ago when I saw them come on the scene because I've been involved in live action role playing for years and I saw Escape Rooms and said, hey, these are like trying to commercialize live action role playing. So I, I started writing some papers about, about what Escape Rooms were. Um, so they're these live action team based games where you solve puzzles and accomplish tasks in one or more rooms to try and accomplish a goal in a limited amount of time. And I wrote this book, came out a few months ago, we talked about it earlier, for it. So if you're a teacher wanting to use escape rooms, then this is something you may wanna take a look at. But I've started to talk about escape rooms in the same way I'm talking about board games. Because the problem I saw is you'd have these escape rooms, like the ancient lair of the dungeon, and that ancient lair would have a clock that would determine when you would get out of the dungeon. I don't know why there is a clock there, but there's a clock there. And there's the scary Sudoku that's going, you have to solve in order to get out and use your black light to shine on what's going on. And then open up the four different padlocks to get through the laser maze of the scary dungeon and escape the ancient lair of the dark dungeon by entering your code on a keypad. What? Why? And this is, so this has been my soapbox in the escape room world for the last many years is talking about ask why. And the reason why it's reflective of their, our game design past, that we've had puzzles that look like this. And so we made them in escape rooms. And the challenge here, we have this battle between narrative and puzzles in escape room design. And it's caused an issue around a concept called ludonarrative dissonance. And this is gonna be important for what we're talking about here. Ludonarrative dissonance is when the play and the story do not connect. When the thing you're supposed to be doing, the role you're supposed to be playing does not connect to the story, things break apart. And so I talked about this model called ask why. And the idea was that you have to ask, why are these things in this world? Why are these things important? And that's been where I've been talking about immersion in escape rooms. And now we're gonna come back to looking at immersion in board games. So in ask why, the idea is that you're gonna take each of these elements, the genre, the setting, the world, the narrative, the challenges and the technology, and always look toward how does it make a, a player experience that is consistent. So now let's go back to talking about board games. So we, we left here where we had this challenge of coming up with all of these different areas of board game immersion. If we wanna make an immersive board game that appeals to a wide audience, we have to address all these things. We can't just have it be a heavy duty thinky game because it's not gonna immerse your storytellers and it's not gonna immerse your people that wanna fiddle with this stuff. So what do we do? So we, said we, we in commercial game design, when you can market to an audience, you don't have to worry about it. You can be like, you know, our audience, they're just focused on heavy thinky games. That's great. That's who we're going to focus on. We make our heavy thinky game. People will enjoy it. Our audience will buy it. That's fine. But again, in our challenge, when we're making games for education, we have to deal with a wide variety of learners and a wide variety of ways to immerse those learners. And that brings us to the rainbow. See, we're back to rainbows. The rainbow of Ask Why for improved immersion. And so the idea here is that you connect all of these areas, that you make sure that your challenge is connected to the social interaction. And the social interaction is connected to the representation, which is connected back to the challenge, that these all exist together. And this is where the ask why comes in, where when you start to think about, well, why are people interacting with, with each other? And how do we make a challenge that's going to get them interacting with each other? You make it so those two things happen at the same time. And then you look at your representation and say, what are we putting into this game? How does it connect to the challenge? How does it connect to the social interaction? Because if you connect all of these as a designer, if you ask why on your board game design and make sure all of these connect, then people can find any single aspect of this immersive and the fact they're all connected means they will then get to explore everything else in your game that it's all connected together, that you don't have to try to learn this challenge, but then you're doing this. So like Dominion, 
uh, almost makes fun of itself with the ridiculousness of the premise of the game as compared to the mechanisms and what you're doing in the challenge of the game. They're two separate things. And that's what I want you to avoid if you are looking to make a more immersive game to a wider audience, is you have to make sure that the role that you have the player in and the actions that you have the player doing and the way the player is doing those things all connect all together. So bringing in Ask Why again, with our board game world, we need to make sure that the genre, the setting, the world, the narrative and the challenges and the way you represent that that all feeds into the player experience and it's all connected. And that's where that rainbow of connection comes into play. Now, I teach board game design. I've, uh, I teach students who want to make board games at our, at our program in Laurier in Canada. We focus on games with learning outcomes. We focus on games as art. We help students to find their voice to create art style games to convey messages. We focus, we don't create games that are around violence or colonization, but instead we're focused on making games to help people uh, indicate their, their challenges in life, to help people understand what they're dealing with, to convey messages. And as I'm dealing with students, I have to teach them how to art because game design is an art. And so I'm gonna now take you through the process that I go through with my students. Now, those of you that have made games, you have your own processes, you understand how to do it, but this is really targeting those of you that have never made a game and you want some guidance on how to start making a game, I'm gonna give you a process you can follow to create a consistent game. So you start with thinking about these questions and each of these questions, you write down the answers to. Now, you, you, this is your brainstorming part. This is where you're defining your bedrock. So what is the genre of the game? Genres are really useful in game design because they're a shortcut. They're a shortcut for us to put together a package of things, a package of concepts, actions, verbs, roles, stories that we can pull on as a game designer and that we know our players will come to the table expecting. So it can be really helpful to think about the genre of the game you're going to create right up front. Say it's this kind of a game. What's the world in which the game is set? So this is where you think about what is going on here. And I notice right away, a lot of people, when they start making games, they start with the mechanisms. They start with, I'm going to make this puzzly thing. And, and I'm not saying to do that. If your goal is to make this immersive game that connects all of these, then you wanna start by making the environment. You wanna make the world in which this game is set. So what's the world? Where's the game set? Is it in a real place? Is it in a fantasy place? And as a recommendation, again, if you're making learning games, there's so many real world settings that are interesting and engaging for setting games. You don't have to make it up. And it becomes a really great learning outcome, even if it's if you make a math game, but you set it in this specific time period, looking at how math was being used then, that now adds to the learning. It's, it's exciting. It gets people excited to learn more about that topic. So there's lots of times and lots of places you can set your games in and you've got all this background material already there to explore. What's the role of the players? So this is where now you have a world. Now you want to, and you have a genre. You know what kind of game it is. Who are the players? Now, here's the way I do this is I brainstorm who are all of the different types of actors in that world. So let's say I wanted to make a game <clears throat> about, uh, oh, I don't know, selling tulips. So that game, you would have people that would produce tulips. You would have people that would want to buy tulips. And then you would have people that are in the middle kind of marketers of tulips. And you wanna say, well, of these different roles, who are the players gonna be? Uh, the players could be one of those roles. The players are all gonna be buyers and sellers of tulips, those middlemen. Or you can say, some players are gonna be producing tulips. Some players are going to be buying tulips. Um, and some players are going to be middlemen. So you'd have three different roles in the game. But you might say, okay, we're going to make all the players tulip producers in this world. So, and you can see how by brainstorming it, you can come up with different games based on what the players are because everything else the game simulates. So you figure out who the players are and then you let everyone else play. Uh, the game is going to take care of everything else. So who are the players and what are they going to engage with? And what are the goals of the players? Now, part of your struggle at this point is thinking through are the players actually in the game 
or are the players in this more middle management role where we're watching what's going on and pushing things about, but I don't actually have a, a defined role in the game. So you want to think about is the player actually in the game or is the player just uh, controlling that sort of, I want to create a story that emerges with what's going on. It'd be the difference of I'm, I'm running a single character in a role-playing game as compared to I'm running a party of characters all with different abilities in a role-playing game. So those are going to be two very different approaches. You want to think about the goals. So one thing we talk about when we teach our students how to make games, we talk about roles and goals. And so the idea is that who are the roles of the players and what are the goals that those players would have in those roles? And that's where you figure out the game. What are the roles and what are the goals? And then what's in the way? The game gets interesting because there's obstacles in the way. So what's blocking the players from reaching the goals? This is where you start. You figure out these things. And this becomes that baseline that you're going with because you want to avoid ludonarrative dissonance. If you have a good solid base to build on, then you can make sure all your other choices make sense. If your base is leaky and messy, then if you just start throwing in mechanisms in there, you're gonna have a bunch of mechanisms and it still could be immersive to people like, who like the systems, but it's gonna frustrate people who like to take on the role, who like to put themselves in that world. Now, again, as I mentioned earlier, we're talking about learning games. And so the learning outcomes are your lighthouse. So what you do throughout this whole time, you always ask, is this decision taking me toward the learning outcomes or taking me away from the learning outcomes? So as you go through each of these questions, you say, all right, I need a genre. What genres will help me approach the learning outcomes? What worlds head me toward the learning outcomes? What roles for players make the most sense for my learning outcomes? So that's your guide throughout all of this to help you create a game that's actually teaching something. Then the next step is verbs. So we've talked about who, We've talked about what they're trying to do. We've talked about the stuff in the way. Now you want verbs and the verbs are the actions. What would someone in that role do if they wanted to overcome the obstacles and reach the goal? What are the actions? Those become your game mechanisms. Those are the things people are going to do in the game. And when possible, again, that lighthouse thing, what real world activities could tie into these actions? How do you engage those learning outcomes with the actions? Games at their heart are about resource management. All games are about resource management. You have some scarce resources that you're trying to use, spend, acquire. What are the resources in the game? Think about people in those roles, achieving those goals through actions. What resources are scarce? Because that's at the heart of what makes a game competitive and interesting challenges is scarcity of resources. If you had everything, then it wouldn't be a challenge. So instead, is it time, number of actions? Is it money? Is it materials? Is it location? The scarcity is where you have that conflict and challenges going on there. But then you want to think about what does that tie into in the real world? The third thing to consider is how do people in that role interact with other people in these roles? So for all the player roles, you want to think about how they would interact. Are they competitors with each other? Does it make sense they would compete? Are they collaborators with each other? Would they be working together against some other group? And this is where you're thinking through again, what is played by others players as compared to what is played by the game. So these are sort of the questions, the next steps when you make a game, you think about all of this because that can help you make sure that all of these fall into line with what you answered previously, that you can avoid ludonarrative dissonance and you can make a more immersive game. So that brings us back to this rainbow of ask why. The idea here is that you wanna connect all of this together. You do that by answering these questions up front before you actually start designing because that gives you, and there's a lot of this stuff you're gonna answer the players may never see. You build out, I use Disney a lot when I'm teaching game design. And if you look at Disney attractions, they have this whole world, this whole story built up and then the attraction lets you see a little bit of it, but there's a lot of it you don't ever see, but it's there, it's documented for consistency's sake. And the same thing is true here. You're gonna document a lot more about your game world and about the environment than the players will actually engage with if your goal is to make an immersive game that hits all of these spaces. So we're gonna end with a case study. Um, I thought through all the games that I've engaged and this is the game that we use in our, we teach it in our classes. We have our students uh, understand this game. If you're looking for a good game model to build a, an educational game off of, I would point you to Flashpoint. So we're gonna talk about how it hits all of these points, um, how it becomes a very immersive game for a lot of players. So Flashpoint is a cooperative game. You're working together and you're playing a team of firefighters trying to put out fires in a building. Uh, it's a relatively straightforward game to play. 
And what you're doing in this game is each of you is playing a firefighter. You've got the building is burning, what you see in front of you. You have fires and the fires spread from space to space based upon the roll of dice at the end of each round. So you know the fires, you can see where fires are, you can see where there's smoke, you can see where there's dangerous chemicals, you can see where there's hot spots. Um, the black cubes represent damage to the walls. So you actually have the ability to carve through a wall if you need to get through it because you can't get through the door. Um, and the question marks that you see are the people who, their noises that might be people. So at the heart of the game, you're trying to rescue people. And if those question marks get burned, then you flip it over and see if it was a person or just a noise. And if you lose too many people, you lose the game. On the outside of the board, you've got a fire truck and you've got an ambulance. Now, the first thing that, that Flashpoint does is it gives you a role. So you have a specific role you play on the team. Now, everyone has the same base amount of stuff they can do, but each person is better and or worse at specific things. So you've got the, uh, the, the firefighter who can extinguish things better. You've got someone who can identify if that noise is a person. You've got someone who's better at driving the trucks. Uh, you've got the generalist who doesn't do anything well, but can do a lot of stuff. The rescue specialist is good at chopping and dragging people out. So you have a role to play in the game that immerses you in what's going on. In expansions, they added in the dog, <laughs> the Dalmatian as one of the players that you can play. And so when you play the game, it uses an action point system. So this is the scarcity. The scarcity is you can only do so many things. Based on your character, you have a number of action points. And for this character, they have four action points. So to move, it takes one. To move through fire, it takes two. You can see these are your verbs. And so this, to make the game, you said the players are these roles. What do they do in these roles? Here are the verbs, okay? We give each verb a set of action points. That allows the player to have interesting decisions about what's going on, but it's pretty easy. It makes sense. It all feels like you're doing what you should be doing if you were a firefighter. So then you go in and you're trying to rescue these people. The fire spreads. So there's some predictability because you know the fire is going to spread from where it is, but you roll dice so it's not completely predictable. You don't know exactly which fire is going to push out after each player goes. So you know where there's danger, but you don't know what will then trigger and, and, and blow up. So that's that balance. There's some balance to keep people engaged. It's not completely predictable. But this is the most engaging part. This, is, this, little, this little fidelity piece is brilliant. And that is when you flip those tokens over, some of them have people, and then there is a dog and a cat. And the fact that when you flip over the dog or the cat, for some people, that is an entirely immersive and game-changing outcome. And they will throw their entire gameplay away simply to go and save the dog or save the cat. And that, that, that decision, brilliant decision, that little bit of fidelity adds so much to the immersiveness for specific players to this game. And to the point, I was speaking with someone else about it, and they got incredibly upset when they played the game because they weren't able to save the cat. And they gotten so immersed that it was just heartbreaking for them to see that happen. So it's little things like this. This is it does immersion does not have to be fancy graphics, but it's thinking through the details that would matter to you if you were playing in that role. So to summarize what I've run through here, different people perceive different things as immersive, and therefore it's really hard to make a one thing and say, this is my immersive game. It's immersive in this way. You're not going to appeal to everyone. That might not matter to you. That might be fine. And I don't want you to take this lecture away and say, Scott said we have to do everything. No, you don't. You don't have to do everything. But if you are trying to create a game that's immersive to as many different people as possible, then you have to consider these uh, all these areas. You want to start with a consistent genre, world, and people in that world. So document this. Start by thinking about what kind of game is it? What's the space? Who's in that space? And then you want to think about, well, what do those people want? What's in the way? And what are the verbs, the mechanisms that get between them and getting that thing? And those become your game mechanisms. And then you want to think about how do those people interact? What makes sense? And how do we create interactions in the game that mirror what would be going on with them in the real world? How do we create these immersive interactions? And if you're doing this from a learning perspective, you're always asking, how are my decisions helping us reach that learning outcome? How are we getting closer with the games I'm making? Then you think about what's scarce. What's scarce in the game? Because those scarcities are where there's going to be conflict. Those scarcities is where cooperation comes in. The things that are scarce is where the game is interesting. Those are the resources that people are engaging with. You figure out what do people give up to get those scarcities. The scarcities are what makes the game interesting. 
and then to consider what details could I add? What components could I add to deepen that connection between players and the roles in the world? Uh, Wingspan, for example, has gotten uh, a lot of accolades, which it would not have gotten had they just used generic birds with statistics on the cards. Even if they'd used pictures of pretty birds with statistics on the cards, it would not have gotten the accolades it did because there's actual factual details about the birds on the cards. That detail creates this, makes this game very immersive for some people and has given this game a lot of attention because you get to learn a little bit about the birds and where they nest and the sort of things that, and then they look to create mechanisms that made sense for the specific birds. So those details added a lot of fidelity to the game. So look for those opportunities. And then always be guided by your learning outcomes. You always wanna keep that lighthouse and drive toward. So to close out, <clears throat> I'm going to give a little plug for what I'm doing right now and how you can get involved. So uh, I, as I mentioned earlier, I've been doing a lot of work in escape games. And what I found is I was, I was giving a talk on escape games to the M Education Alliance, which is a group that works at educational technology in low resource classrooms. And I was giving a talk about escape games and a question came up that said, hey, Scott, um, how can we do this in a classroom? How can we do a game with locks and boxes or lots of paper in a classroom where all we have is a chalkboard and found objects in low resource classrooms? And so this, I'm on a sabbatical for my university this year. My main project is to figure out how can we create a game structure that will let us do escape games in a low resource classroom where the only resource you have is a chalkboard. Now I'm pulling heavily from things like Parsley games, interactive fiction, uh, LARPing, I'm pulling these all together. If you're an educator and you would like to keep up with this project, I'm looking for people to play test the games. I'm developing the, the system live as I'm developing. You can see it on Facebook. There's a group called Escape If. That's what I'm calling this project, Escape If, Escape Interactive Fiction. Um, at the start for this first year, I'm partnering with math educators in Africa to create these low resource games. But after the year as this is developed, it'll be a toolkit that anyone can use to make games for their classrooms where you can use these escape games without using a lot of resources. I'll ask for you to join that group. That's gonna be how you can keep up with what's going on. If you wanna keep up with me on Twitter or Facebook, it's there. All the articles I've been referring to, if you go to scottnicholson.com, full text articles, you'll see my Ask Why article. You'll see a lot of other articles that are written there about all of these topics. So I am at the end of my talk. I see I have a few minutes left for questions. So let us see, I'm now looking, finally I'm blinking, bink, bink at the, uh, at the chat as I start to. Uh... <laughs> All right, so we have a question. Um, so we have a, a, someone who's in master's degree working in the relation between games and space through the concept of production of space. Can we understand immersion directly through space? How the surrounding space of the game or immersion can affect the perception of space? So then and that's an interesting question about how you perceive the space around you. Um, and assuming I'm understanding the question, and I think about with this, my, my escape room world and thinking about with escape rooms, that you're very much engaging in, in the escape room world, your space, your environment is a key part of the game you're creating. Um, occasionally, I've seen games play with this. There was a game, uh, and the name escapes me right now, but it was a game that came with a dart gun. And what would happen in the game is you were hunting for it was an African hunting game and you'd flip a card and the card would tell you what you needed to shoot or not shoot of these targets with dart guns. And so that was all fun and we're shooting darts, but then we realized we're playing this game in a convention hall. And so the next table over is this war game. And every so often a dart would go flying across and go into the war game table. And that, that didn't work so well. Um, there's another game uh, called Schnapp. Uh, Schnapp is a hobby game, a German hobby game. And uh, you, what you had in Schnapp is you have a teeter-totter. And so this teeter-totter, you put a disc that's got a plane back on one side of the teeter-totter, but the other side of the disc has a color on it. Each player is a color. You slap the teeter-totter, the disc goes flying into the air. You have to look and see if it's your color. And if it is, you have to go catch it. This is a game where the environment is important that you're playing in. <laughs> because you can end up having things that become obstacles or get destroyed because people are running like crazy people around. Um, so I look for games that have that kind of physical plainness. Actually in Going, Going, Gone, I did something with this. So Going, Going, Gone was an auction game published by Stronghold Games in 2012. And I wanted to create a game that got people more into the mindset of being dumb in an auction. I wanted to create that experience of losing your mind in an auction. So the way I did that is in each round of the auction, you were bidding on five separate auctions in 10 seconds. 
And the way that happened is there were five cups. Each cup would be representing one auction item. You had cubes of your color. And in 10 seconds, you would throw cubes into the cups as fast as you can. And so you would watch people get physically engaged with each other trying to get their bids in, which is what I wanted. I wanted that playfulness and that engagement. So it's interesting. Alexander's trying to explore the engagement of space. You're going to find some players that is not immersive at all. Players hated that game. It's like, I do not want to do that. I want to just think, which is fine. Recognize that some people do not want to engage with that larger space. They want to be immersed in the game rather than be immersed up here. We actually did a little exploration, a little study on iPad games to look at settlers to see if people did more trading in physical settlers or more trading in iPad settlers. And we found that people did less trading in iPad settlers for a couple of reasons. One, it was more complex. But two, you, when you were playing an iPad game, your focus goes into this screen and forgets that there's an environment under the players around you. And the reality is these other players are just very slow AI. You got to wait for you to take their turn as compared to with the board where you're more engaged with other people. That's why I always look for games where you have cards that you have up here because then you're more likely to engage directly with other people than always having your head down. So I think about that when I make my games. Um, so Daniel asked about the experience with games for therapy. Um, so it's interesting. My other project that I'm engaging in this year on my sabbatical is I'm going to make an escape game. And, I, and the nice thing about being on sabbatical is I can kind of do whatever I think needs to be done. So the thing that I have done over the last year that's been most important to me is developing a mindfulness routine and doing meditation. That has been really valuable to me over the last year and a half to get through this is finding my own spaces. And what I found is the more times I did these meditations, the more I would make these spaces that became my safe spaces to go into when I was feeling stressed out. And I said, I wanna make a game that gets people doing that. So as I started to explore this in the education world, I, I explored social emotional learning. And so now what I'm doing is I've realized mindfulness is a piece of social emotional learning. There's several other components as well. So my first project for this is going to be around exploring the four, the four major areas of social emotional learning that all lead to good decision making. I'm going to make an escape game where there's four different games. Each player plays one of these boxes or one of these games. They have to communicate with the others. And as they're doing so, they're learning about the different parts of social emotional learning. Then where I'll go from that are games to help you to develop each of those areas. So that's where I'm going to go as far as the therapy piece. I'm making sure and working with uh, professionals in the area. So not just making it all up, but that's where I'm going with that, that therapy concept. Whew. So uh, Greg has asked if I've done or recommend any work on the material overlap of out of game player and in game player character. Um, like uh, I have not, this is not something I know of work on. If you know of work that looks at in game versus out of game stuff, feel free to post it in the link. Uh, that's not something I've done any work on. So, And I see someone posted crossbows and catapults. So originally when I was making this model, the term I wanted to use instead of representation was sensual. Because really, that's what, when I'm playing a game, I'm looking for a sensual game. The problem is sensual is such a loaded term, but that's what it is. It's appealing to my senses. It's a game that lets me flick things, that lets me engage physically, that lets me hear things, that lets me uh, smell things. Well, in Gen Con, I don't necessarily want to smell things, but there are games where like there's a wine tasting game where they have a lot of sense with it. So that idea of how do you appeal to the senses in games, that's a, that's a really good way to engage people, to immerse people, but also there's gonna be some people that will not like that at all. So it's always something to consider with. And I see Evan has posted the smell of Gen Con. And on that fine note, I will pass the floor over to him to wrap this up. Thank you, Scott. And um, I, 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 again, uh, you knocked it out of the park. I don't know if you want to revisit the chat. It's sort of a, 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 a battlefield full of various uh, 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 memes and ideas and everything. But yeah, don't yeah, read it, the comments. Yeah, we are. We are. We are so <laughs> deeply appreciative of this, and I'm already getting requests for this to be posted somewhere on YouTube or whatnot. And so then if people are watching this on some later date, then they can admire the self-reflexive moment of, of having that that ask happen right now. But in any case, uh, th this was an amazing talk. It really does, I think, highlight a number of different issues that we have between design and teaching um, this this stuff and and this is this is just just absolutely amazing that we were able to do this with a, a global audience in this way. So 
Um, thank you so much. And for those who are continuing to participate in the Generation Analog uh, uh, Conference today, we have an hour lunch break and we'll come back at 2 p.m. EDT with uh, our second full panel on analog digital hybridity. And again, uh, thank you. If you've got further questions, discussions, or even just silly memes, you can just go hop over to the Discord and, uh, and engage there. Thank you so much. <laughs>